Good day, friends. Oh, so good to be here with you. Um, I think, just maybe, I think um, my busy last few months is coming to a close. I hope so. Last weekend, I had the pleasure of going to my hometown in the beautiful mountains of the Jasper, Alberta area, and on Saturday to um, officiate at a wedding outdoors on a beautiful fall uh, day with the sun shining and good temperatures. But here I am, and I'm so grateful to be here with you. Thank you for having me in your places. Well, let's get right to it. So thinking about the past few months, uh, my thoughts and emotions have been marked with what I am calling an unsatisfied yearning, a mild discontentment. Quite elusive in nature, yet it's always present, it seems. And it's in the silence of the day, in, the, in my quiet times, I wonder why. What is this mild discontentment, this unsatisfied yearning within me all about? And what am I to make of it? Well, I certainly haven't come to any conclusions, at least not that I can say inconclusively. I really have no big answers, I suppose, to this day. And it was during this past week in my studies and reflections and reading that I was led to the prophet Jeremiah, and specifically the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. And in that chapter, we find included in that chapter uh, a letter uh, to the exiles in Babylon. These were the Israelites taken from Judah into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. We go back to chapter 25, and, and there we see that God, through Jeremiah, had brought his judgment onto Judah for their continual disobedience to the commandments of God. And the text there reveals that Judah had, in all respect, abandoned God and had turned to false gods, idols. Even though God, in his mercy, sent prophet after prophet, uh, warning them to repent and turn back to himself which he would have received them, no doubt. Yet they had refused, and now the judgment of God came upon Judah. And when we see these things in the Old Testament like this, these judgments from God upon Israel, or we see the judgment to come in the New Testament era that we live in, in the last days, when Jesus comes again, we need to remember, folks, and keep this in mind that it, it, it was God here in Jeremiah, uh, God's sovereign purpose and will uh, that sent Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army to destroy Jerusalem, the temple, and to take Judah into captivity for 70 years. And thinking of my own mild discontentment over these past few months, I can only imagine how great the discontentment was felt by those taken into captivity. Scott Hubbard, editor for Desiring.God, Dot, dot God, DesiringGod.com, pardon me, speaking of the exiles in Babylon highlights how much Babylon was, quote, a step backward for the Israelites. Indeed, Babylon would not have been any desirable place for a faithful Israelite of Jeremiah's day. And discontentment, I am sure, and uh, this unsatisfied yearning to return to Jerusalem must have saturated the thoughts and the emotions of those in captivity. But in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, God, despite even the false prophets that had already spoken to the exile, saying that they would return earlier than the 70 years, wrote them this letter and said, no, 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 you're staying for 70 years, so build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. Jeremiah 29, verse 4 to 7. What about you? Has an unsatisfied yearning, a mild kind of discontentment settled into your mind and emotions these days? Maybe you're yearning for better days. Maybe this place where you're at reminds you of your losses. Maybe you feel stuck and you want out of something. Maybe you're far from what is familiar, even though 
you might have been in this place a long time, your family and your friends and those things that you love so much are not here with you. Maybe you feel, your life is, feels like it's moving so fast ahead of you or going so fast you've lost your bearings somehow. And there it is still, this nagging, unsettled yearning, this annoying, mild discontentment. Well, friends, turn to Psalm uh, 119 as we continue in our sermon series. And we'll pick it up at verse 17 through to verse 24. Psalm 119, verse 17. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princesses sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Our Lord and God, we thank you. As we now turn our hearts and minds to your word, O Lord, help us to understand by your spirit what this is all about for us today. More than that, that we would understand your word, that we would understand that through your word we find the character and nature of who you are, Lord. And may we revel in that, in your mercy and kindness and your justness and all that you are, that you would be honored and praised in how we participate today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we began our study of Psalm 119, among a few other items that we covered, we had highlighted two um, themes that stand out amongst other themes. One, the psalmist declares throughout uh, the majority of these 176 verses before us the sufficiency of the Word of God. And two interlaced or woven throughout, if you will, the psalm is the persecution and affliction of the people of God. So now as we look at verse 17 to 24, we find there in that context, in these eight eight verses, verse 22 and 23, reveal the psalmist has suffered greatly because of the persecution. And he turned to God in prayer for help. Let's read verse 17 together. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. The psalmist had turned to Yahweh and prays for his help. Of course, now I have to ask you some questions. Do you need God's help? Do you need it? And why do you need God's help? And do you even ask for God's help? Isaiah the prophet asked for God's help. Isaiah said, but the Lord God helps me. Isaiah 50 verse 7. And Isaiah, we think of his life and time, was prophesying during a very turbulent time in that world that he lived. The political and military landscape changing and shifting and moving. And we think of Isaiah's uh, ministry to Israel, warning the people of Israel and Judah regarding their disobedience to God and then his predictions of their future, which did not look too bright unless they repented. Isaiah, my friends, needed God's help in his life and ministry. And help Isaiah received. For God would not abandon his faithful prophets so that Isaiah could say in the middle of in the midst of these changing times that he was having and the affliction from outside and even from his own people, he could say, therefore, I have not been disgraced. I have set my face like flint. I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7 to 8. So friends, this was the request of the psalmist here in this psalm as he dealt with the affliction and suffering in his context. Let's spend some time with verse 17. First notice with me that the Hebrew verb, which is translated in my translation here, the ESV, deal bountifully means to deal fully with. To deal fully with. Next, notice the phrase in this very first half of this verse, 
with your servant. And with this phrase, we can ask the question, who does the psalmist serve? Who does the psalmist worship? Well, the answer clearly is Yahweh. So like Isaiah, the psalmist prayed for help through the affliction and suffering in his context. But we also should notice that his prayer includes a further request from God to examine his heart as well. So to paraphrase ever so poorly, the psalmist prayed, Yahweh, deal fully with your servant. Yahweh, deal fully with your servant. King David, another servant of Yahweh, asked God for the same kind of testing as he was dealing with his own affliction and the surrounding pagan culture opposed to God. And David prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Psalm 139, 23 to 24. Now I have to ask some questions, don't I? Have you ever asked God to search you and to know your heart? And hold on to that thought that just popped into your mind. And what was that first thing that popped into your mind when I asked you that question? What was the first thing that you felt inside? Maybe some of us shudder and shake at the thought of God's microscope examining our thoughts and hearts. You know, maybe for some of us, for whatever reason, we've forgotten what God has done for us in Christ at the cross. Maybe for some of us, we need to humble ourselves and pray like the psalmist here. God, deal fully with your servant. God, deal fully with me. And may God give us a heart like King David, who was a sinner just like you and me, that we would be able to pray like he did. Test me, Lord, and try me. Examine my heart. Psalm 26, 2. Why, Pastor? Why should we pray like that? Well, friends, because Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, said through his apostles, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 19. And it was with this humble attitude that the psalmist here in this psalm, a servant of Yahweh, prayed. While well, moving along, let's look at the second half of verse 17. 17b, where we read, That I may live and keep your word. Friends, the, here is the why. The why for the psalmist praying for Yahweh's blessing. That his life would become a life worthy of the one he served. A true servant of Yahweh. And please notice that we've also encountered here one of the synonym, synonyms for the word of God. It's right at the end of this verse. It's the word, word, small case w. Whenever we encounter this word, we should understand this as the revealed word of God. In other words, it is a special revelation of God by his written word. My friends, we also need to remember that the word of God is by the reflection of the character and nature of God himself. Therefore, the psalmist prayed that every aspect of his life would be lived in obedience to the word of God. Well, consider with me John's gospel, particular chapter 14. And in that chapter, Jesus said some things that would have caused plenty of discontentment and unease in his days, as it would in our own 21st century. Consider with me our North American culture and consider the impact of the culture on our lives, each one of our lives, and the impact of the culture on the church in North America it would be no stretch that when Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15, that this would rub, rub many of us the wrong way. Let's face it, and let's be honest. Our postmodern individualistic culture that can be described as me, myself, and I has stained our lives and impacted the church. Of course, we say all the right things, particularly on a Sunday morning for an hour and a bit. We speak plenty of Christianese to each other, but when it comes down to it, I wonder how much of it, sadly, is simply 
lip service. And I know that we could walk away from this message all get up and ready to make all sorts of promises to God, yet tomorrow, well, we'll be back to our own agendas, won't we? What I want. No, friends, the psalmist here wants nothing but for Yahweh to open his eyes, that he would be able to behold the wondrous things out of his law. Verse 18. Take a look at that. Notice the phrase here, open my eyes. The Hebrew word translated open in this context and grammatical structure means to uncover, to make known, to reveal. To uncover, make known, to reveal. Someone said, quote, in order to keep God's word, must we not pray to understand it? End quote. Now I want us to consider the state of the North American Evangelical Church today. And I would, I would dare you, I would dare you to check it out for yourself and spend the time doing it. And you will see preachers and teachers and self-appointed prophets and apostles and others proclaiming direct revelation from God. Apparently, unlike our psalmist here, the word of God is not sufficient. And we need new revelation from God for our day. But think about this, or listen to this. Listen to how Jesus prayed. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 to 26. So what has God hidden? Well, he has hidden the wisdom and revelation of himself. Jesus, Jesus continued to pray. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Matthew eleven twenty-seven. 27. My friends, the psalmist didn't pray for, for new revelation from, God, from Yahweh or about Yahweh. The psalmist prayed that Yahweh would open his eyes to know the law, to know the word of God, and thereby know God himself. Someone once said, reflecting on believers in our context, quote, it is a shame that many Christians look for this, their sense of wonder to be satisfied without looking to the word of God, end quote. Of course, we pray that our spiritual, for our spiritual, that our spiritual eyes would be opened to the wondrous things out of the word of God. But dear friends, we have a part in this as well, and that is to study the word of God for ourselves. Well, let's move on to verse 19 to 20. And here the psalmist continues to pray in the same manner, but the reason has changed somewhat. Verse 19, I am a sojourner on the earth. You know, going back to my earlier comments regarding the mild discontentment in my life, it is here at verse 19, in light of the psalmist's prayer, that I began to grasp what might be the source of my unsatisfied yearning that I am but a sojourner, or to put it another way, a stranger on this earth, on this planet. We go to the letter to the Hebrews chapter 11 specifically, and there the reader, we read of the list of Old Testament saints who by putting their faith in God pleased them, pleased God. Yet everyone that the Hebrew 11 list died in faith, not having received the thing promised, it tells us there, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and have acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. Hebrews eleven thirteen. My friend, consider this. The Hebrew translated sojourner or stranger in our text means exactly that. Someone who is a stranger and exile on earth. Someone living out of their own country. While well, returning to Scott Hubbard with his commentary concerning the Israelites in Babylonian exile, Hubbard highlights that the word of God invited and welcomed them to uh, the Israelites in exile. Remember that, quote, God, not Jerusalem, was their true dwelling place. That the Israelites had always been strangers and sojourners, even in Jerusalem. And you and me, as followers of Jesus, are no different. We too are like the psalmist said, a sojourner on earth, verse 18 we too are strangers and exiles on earth, as Hebrew chapter 11 exhorts. 
But here's the question then. Here's the question that comes out of this. Have we become exceedingly comfortable with our exile? Have we become too comfortable with our exile? Boyce, in his commentary, put it this way, quote, If you are trying to follow God, the world is going to treat you as an alien, for that is what you will be. You cannot expect to be at home in it, and if you are, well, it is an indication that you really don't belong to Christ, or at least are living far from him, end quote. My friends, this was not the case for the psalmist who continued to pray, Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your just decrees at all times. Verse 18 and 19. Jesus describes for us, in his own words, what was at the heart of the psalmist's prayer in our text. And we find this in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, verse 6. So how could this spiritual hunger and thirst be satisfied? Who would satisfy this kind of spiritual hunger and thirst in a soul? We go to John's Gospel for the answer. Pardon me. John 6 gives us the account of Jesus feeding thousands. And then we find him walking on water. And then Jesus turns to the crowds that had followed him across from the Sea of Galilee. And he said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Who can satisfy the psalmist's spiritual hunger? Who can satisfy your soul and my soul? Well, with the words of this hymn, who can satisfy my soul like you? Who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do? Who could ever be more faithful and true? I will trust in you. I will trust in you, my God. Well, let's move along to verse 21 to 24. Here we find what the psalmist is struggling with and the affliction that was coming his way. First notice that there are people in the psalmist's context in his time that in their pride willfully disobey God. They treat God as willy-nilly, could care less about him. Verse 21, you rebuke the insolent, that is the prideful, the cursed ones who wander from your commandments. You know, the Apostle Paul had something to say about this. And he gives us a diagnosis of the condition of fallen humanity. Paul would say, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their righteous, unrighteousness suppress the truth. Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The psalmist, instead of suppressing the truth, has kept Yahweh's testimonies. Even as the famous People of the world plot against the psalmist, and scorn and contempt come his way. The servant of Yahweh will meditate on his statutes. Verse 23. The psalmist goes on and takes great delight in Yahweh's testimonies. Verse 24. The psalmist so delights in the word of God that later on he would say in verse 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. See, the psalmist knew where the righteousness that he required to live a holy life came from. It came from God by putting his faith and trust in God alone. And God alone would look at the psalmist and he would apply all that Christ had done even before it had been done onto the psalmist's life and gave him the righteousness of God and took his sins away. Well, friends, followers of Jesus Christ, we are sojourners and exiles in this world. And maybe our unsatisfied yearning, our mild discontentment that is ever-present, is pointing to this biblical truth. Scott Hubbard puts it this way in closing, quote, One day soon we will wake up in the place we have always longed for, and we will live there forever. But for now, dear Christian exile, Trust the wisdom of your master gardener, and may I add, trust the wisdom of the word of God. Unpack your boxes, stay and make disciples, and love the place that you want to leave. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, so much. Lord, I pray for everyone hearing this or watching this or both, whatever, however that works. I pray, God, that their yearning and their discontentment, they would turn that towards you. 
I pray for anyone who's hearing this that does not know you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you would open their ears, their spiritual eyes, and that they would be granted repentance unto salvation. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for having me. God bless. Yeah. Shalom.